Hey everyone, I hope you're having a fantastic day so far. Today, I want to talk about being a contracted program manager and how it uniquely links in with performance coaching. Now, the only reason I wanted to talk about this is because the other day when I was speaking to one of the deputy directors who was reporting to me in terms of progress with their work stream, I realized actually, do you know what? I'm kind of doing performance coaching in this session. And I thought to myself, actually, there are some clear links in relation to me being a program manager and me being a performance coach. For those of you who know, I'm a performance coach outside of this space, coaching mainly portfolio leaders and consultant coaches to build their business and their life. So I thought I'd talk about some of the comparisons that I've realized when it comes to being a program manager in the contracting space and being a performance coach. Now, I will say that it's important to note that for me, discipline is key, okay? It's really important to embed this discipline. I'm referencing my LinkedIn post I sent out this morning. And I say that because without the discipline, there is no level of familiarity or standardization or quality or whatever it may be. None of this stuff happens. And so with that in mind, I also recognize that the people factor is also extremely important. I was watching a video with Ray Dalio and Tom Bilio from Impact Theory, and they're talking about how there's going to be a crash coming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But anyway, the point being made is that Ray Dalio, a really highly respected investor, a very successful one, was basically saying there's no point having all this structure if there is no level of principles or behaviors that are being exuded, okay? There's no sort of like level playing field when it comes to understanding how to operate. And I 100% agree because essentially what he's saying to me is that people need to embed or have an agreed set of values that they're working towards in order to exude behaviors that live within the right structure. And there you are going to get success. Anyway, I'm not trying to make this philosophical. I want to just put that as a standing point because human connection or the human aspect or the human condition contributes to about 80 to 90%, of course, that's arbitrary, of any success within any program because you're dealing with human beings. You could argue it's 100%. So with that in mind, let me get into it. I've got three different things I want to talk about. So the first thing is creating accountability. Now, accountability, okay, whether you're coaching or contracting or consulting, whatever it may be, is heavily defined by the level of governance that you set up. What does that really mean for people who are not within a certain frame? Governance is creating the right level of accountability through reporting, through meetings, through assurance. Governance is making sure that things are being done and holding a body, a person, someone to account for deliverables. That's essentially what governance is. And so usually what I do when I come into an organization is that I make sure that I set the right level of governance and assess what is happening at the moment. And this may be a combination of stand-ups daily. This may be weekly progress sessions. This may be task and finish groups or monthly steering groups or board meetings, whatever it may be. And anything that's not set up, I will set it up. I'll make sure it's set up with the right terms of reference for each thing. So the first thing is making sure that you create the right level of accountability. Now, what I will say is that for these sessions, for these meetings that are happening within this framework of cadence or rhythm, you need to make sure the right level of psychological safety has been developed. Now, of course, we're living in a mental health world where something like psychological safety is something that has mentioned time and time again. And essentially is making sure that people feel comfortable, as comfortable as possible, to basically say what's on their minds, to be their authentic selves. Now, there's a question around whether you can truly be your authentic self at work. I'm not gonna answer that question, I'll leave that up to you, but you can be a version of yourself that is comfortable and not uncomfortable really expressing themselves when it comes to the matters of work. And so I've listed five different key things that I think are required for good psychological safety, especially within meetings. So the first thing is healthy challenge. So challenge is important to make sure that you invoke creativity and critical thinking. It's not being negative, it's just making sure that you inspire those different things. The second thing, which is the cousin to it or linked to it, is healthy support. Now, support is important for encouragement, motivation, affirming ideas. Now, of course, if you have too much challenge, 
you get to a situation where people don't feel comfortable or feel attacked at the workspace. And so you have things like burnout or anxiety or avoidance, whatever it may be. If there's too much support, then you may have complacency, laziness, lethargy, all this kind of stuff. So there has to be a fine balance between the two so you can get what's called growth. Okay, so this is a great coaching model. Then you also have to have, this is the third factor, genuine engagement, okay? So what I mean by that is the person needs to feel like, you know, you're actually engaging with them, okay? You un you're invested in them as a person, so to speak. And so think about being yourself when speaking to these people and not some sort of professional, you know, <laughs> that people try to be in workspaces. Just be yourself. This They employed you for a reason, Okay. Oh, well, not employed, you contracted you for a reason. The next thing is relatable rapport. So this is making sure that you can talk to people about different things that are slightly informal by nature. So, you know, your weekend or how their partner or family is doing. I'm not saying you need to be friends with these individuals. I'm not saying you need to go deep, but there needs to be some sort of exchange where, okay, you can follow on from the last conversation to see how things are going and vice versa. It's not about being guarded and asking all the questions. You also need to be able to give some sort of response back. So yeah, be comfortable doing that stuff. And the fifth thing is trust via expertise and skills that are demonstrated by results, okay? Delivered results and appropriate vulnerability. So what do I mean by this? Appropriate vulnerability is essentially where you're able to express yourself but you're not being inappropriate and being all over the place because you're within a professional environment. And there's a time and place for that as well. Of course, that's up to you how you take that information, but that is what I believe at least anyway. So creating accountability is the first key. The second thing is tackling big problems. Now, within the coaching space, you may have heard of the T Grow model, which stands for topic, goal, reality, options, and way forward. Now, this is a way that you structure the conversation or the meeting in order to understand what to do next because coaching is about performance, okay? You know, the T-Grow model was adopted from the Grow model, which was developed by the guy who wrote Coaching for Performance, so John Whitmore, okay? Some great guy within the UK who had a very much a consulting sort of background but really embedded the key roots of coaching within his amazing book. And a lot of the stuff that we do today in terms of real coaching is based on the works that he'd done. Of course, Grow or T-Grow is heavily sort of like dependent upon or sourced from the idea of how we have conversations anyway. And so when I was having this conversation with this deputy director, I realized that actually I'm following the T grow model. Now, when it comes to the T, the topic, that's already assumed, okay, based on the fact that we're talking about the program, we're talking about the work stream. So there's no need to go down that route. The goal may change depending on whether there are urgent issues that need to be relayed within that session. But essentially the goal is really to understand what is happening in terms of delivery. That is the goal for the session. And, and this is true for any sort of like program manager, project manager, whatever it may be in their progress update sessions. The reality bit is getting to a point of understanding what is actually happening, getting into the weeds of it, okay? Sometimes you can be a program manager and be so sort of like far off, but sometimes you need to understand and dissect certain things so that you can understand what the rate limiting steps are. What are the real risks? What are the real issues? What are the real dependencies? What is being assumed? What key decisions need to be made? And so, of course, when you sort of like get that reality bit, and this is where the person's usually more lively or whatever it may be because they're getting into it, then it's posing to them, okay, so what are the real options that we have in terms of moving forward? You throw it back to them. It's very consulting by nature, but it's also very coaching by nature, okay? And so once you've done options, you want to then decide, okay, together, okay, this is the best way forward. Okay, see what I did there with the grow? You start to decide what actions need to be taken in order to honor that option that you chose or that they chose. And this is where you're making sure that you utilize the right sort of like structures su such as determining sort of like actions who's doing what, when it was decided, how long you're due to do it for, the rag status of it, any comments related to it, a typical action log or Kanban board. 
Now, of course, when talking about the reality bit, really this is the individual talking about what's happening for those products within a project or program. And the way I sort of try to extract this information is using the SCHEMES acronym, okay? So I've spoke about this before. This is talking about the space or the environment that you're in, cash, which is finance. You've got helpers, which is the resources or the people that are helping or contributing to this, sometimes known as FTE, full-time equivalent. Then you've got equipment, so things that are being used, materials, expertise, so quality assurers, technical people, people who understand the business of it all. So sometimes that's change managers, so to speak, and systems, okay? Systems and processes, really, so that's schemes. So essentially, all of this stuff, whilst you're asking these key questions using the T-Grow model, the Grow model in this instance, they are updating their project workbook or their work stream workbook in order for them to really record what is happening because if it's not recorded, it doesn't exist. And if it gets audited for whatever reason, whether this is by, you know, cabinet office or whoever it may be, then at least the information is there. So this is about having due diligence. Yes, you're filling it in with the initial stuff that I spoke about in terms of the human side, talking to people as, hu as human beings, but the same side, you're making sure there's the right rigor as well. So hopefully that makes sense for the second part. The third part is showing empathy. So following on from what I just said, you need to talk to your team as if they were humans, okay? One-to-one. -one, okay? Human beings that you can connect with, that have their own issues, that have their own concerns, that have their own problems, that have their own feelings. It's important to understand that they can't just be a resource. I know I use that term, but I don't necessarily like that term because it kind of sees people as human capital, so to speak. It doesn't make it less true, but the language of it is very disconcerting or disconnected to the fact that we have living organisms who have a soul or spirit, whether you want to believe that or not, who feel a certain way, who experience. And so when you can talk to people at a certain level, okay, with this lens, then they see you and you see them. Really important stuff. And this is how you can be a great program manager or coach just in general. And so I feel that when I'm able to really assume this position of leadership, then that is thrown back to me as well. That is exactly what comes back to me because they're seeing it being demonstrated and really leaders lead by example. It's that simple. And so I'm lucky enough to have a great team right now within this contract. Everyone is amazing. I really love the energy that they throw. Of course, we have our challenges, but that's not for you guys to know. That's for me to know and for them to know. And so I want to leave it there. And so hopefully this is giving you some ideas of how being contracted as a program manager or even project manager or any sort of like management consultant professional links in with coaching. Okay, so those three key things I spoke about was creating accountability, there's making sure that you tackle big challenges, okay? I didn't even speak about escalation, but that's one of them. And thirdly, showing the right level of empathy. If you are a great coach, you become a great leader and you become a great consultant as well. So I would urge you, if you're interested in understanding how you can deepen your coaching skills, whether that is you wanna be a coach for your own business or whether you wanna bring this into the workspace, then let me know, comment below or message me on LinkedIn, let me know, and I may potentially have something for you. If you wanna see more videos like this centered around life management and portfolio careers, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And as always, my friends, understand, reach and expand.